They're fully exposed and their shame is exposed. It didn't bother them before because they had nothing to hide. Now they do. They disobeyed God and they want to cover it up. But the fig leaves are not enough. So what does God do? God makes animal skins for Adam and Eve. That means something innocent had to die to cover them up. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is really all about the resurrection. That is the whole point, the importance of the resurrection. And as we've covered this chapter, we have pointed out the first four verses, which is how we spent the first week in this chapter, dealing with Paul presents the simple gospel message that he received. Started. So, Paul tells us that the gospel is very much this simple message, the simple message of Christ who came, died for our sins, was buried, and then risen again on the third day, that he was resurrected for our salvation. That is the gospel. And as we continue to look through the first portion of, of chapter 15, Paul then continues all the way up to verse 19 to tell us how crucial the resurrection is. He even points out that if the resurrection did not happen, then we should be the most pitied people on earth. However, he provides an argument for the reality of the resurrection, of which Paul himself was one of the people who witnessed the resurrected Christ. And so not only is it crucial to our faith, not only is it the apex of the gospel, the thing that it all leads to, it is very real, the physical resurrection of Jesus. And then in verses 20 through 28, it really is, not only is the, the gospel, the, the penultimate, the, the, the biggest reason for the gospel is existing, everything that led through Jesus' life, led to the point of the resurrection so that we can be saved, not only is it crucial to the faith, not only is it real, but it serves a very important function, which is the thing that gives us hope. The fact that if Jesus is resurrected in a true physical body, then the church can have that hope that we will be resurrected on that day and receive glorified bodies and the new life that we have in Christ comes with an ultimate salvation, not just the redemption of our soul, but even the redemption of our bodies in the end. And then last week, we dealt with the fact that there was this deception that was creeping into the Corinthian church, because they were a church that's in an area that's heavily focused on philosophy, and they loved thinking about big ideas. They enjoyed asking questions even more than they enjoyed answering them. And they started to beg the question and take a look into this Greek idea that the separation of the soul from the body they viewed as a good thing. And they started to doubt or not teach the physical res resurrection of Christ. And that is a false teaching. And so not to be deceived by anything that's other than the apostles' teaching. See, the Greeks believed or theorized that the physical, the flesh, was bad because the flesh is the thing that we lust after that causes us to sin. And so removing the spirit from the body was actually the aim, was the ultimate hope to become just a spiritual being. But the truth is, Scripture teaches that the physical being is resurrected just like Christ's physical form was resurrected, but it is renewed and given a glorified form. And so tonight, as we're dealing with the next set of verses uh, from verse 35 through 49 of 1 Corinthians, we're dealing with this very idea, the idea of the resurrected body. What is this thing? It's our hope, but what is it? And that is what Paul is going to help us at least try to ascertain this evening. So let's dig in, starting in, in verse 35. It says, someone will say, 
How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. Now, if that sounds like confusing writing, it's because Paul is a confusing guy. But what he's trying to say is that we see this truth in nature. We should grab a hold of this. Now, before we moved out here for the church, we lived in Palmyra. If you don't know where that is, it's basically almost the halfway point between here and Syracuse. We lived decently far away, Juliet and I. And we had this really long kitchen in the back of our house. And when we first moved there, our first fall was really confusing to me because we didn't have any trees on our property, but all of the neighbors had trees at the very edge of their property that all hung over into ours. So we dealt with all of their leaves and all that stuff. But every now and then I was in the kitchen, which had vaulted ceilings. So there was no insulation between us and the, the outdoors really in terms of sound. And every once in a while, you would just hear a giant thud and you had no idea where it was coming from. Until one day, I finally figured out that it was a walnut tree where, whose branches were over our, our house. We actually had to have it cut and we needed to replace our roof at one point because of how much stuff was just falling on the kitchen roof. And you would just hear this random big thud. Now, has anyone ever had walnut trees in their yard before? It's the worst. I do not recommend it. You, we had the smallest yard, but we had five gallon buckets, like several of them filled with walnuts every year because of, they would just fall on the ground. And what would happen is as the trees were dying in the fall, the walnut seeds would fall off and then rot. And then you get the seeds caught in the, in the mower blades. And then occasionally in the spring, you would actually see some sprouts of new trees coming up in the yard that you'd have to tear out. Because what happens is a seed is the reproductive life of the tree. That little green ball that looks almost like a lime at some point in its life is a walnut. And inside of it is the seed and it will fall every autumn, land on the ground. And if it can find a soft spot where it can be buried, especially under the leaves in the snow, and it can make its way into the ground, then in the springtime, it will come up as something new, as a tree. It's the same life. It's the same seed that fell from the walnut tree, but it looks completely different. It has a completely different makeup, almost like how when a caterpillar goes into its chrysalis, but comes out a butterfly. It's the same life, it's the same thing, but it goes through a cycle of change. And that is the point that Paul is making here, that when you sow something, when you sow a seed, you don't get seeds in return, although there are seeds within what is cropped up in the crops that you make from it, but something edible or something beautiful comes out of it. Flowers bloom and blossom and turn into something else, just like the trees. The seed falls and then a tree is exploded from it, but that's the same life. It's changed when it comes up out of the ground. And so, just as we expect, as it is appointed to every man once to die, that we will be resurrected and be made new. And it won't be this. It won't have the same compelling need to go after the lusts of the flesh. It will be made into something different, like the tree or like the butterfly. We will be made into something new, like Christ and his resurrected body, who was able to enter a locked room with closed windows and doors because there's something extra, there's something added to the new form, to the glorified form. And so that's the idea that Paul is sharing with us. It's not, there's not an end. It's not just some sort of spiritual, ethereal thing. No, there is a physical resurrection that is to come for those who believe. In verse 39, he says, all flesh 
is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, and another flesh of fish, and another of birds. And he's pointing out that there are different kinds of flesh and meat as all living things have different types of bodies or flesh, then I must give you this announcement that beef is better than chicken or fish. It's just true. So the idea that it's different, things become different. So why would we expect it always to be the same or to be left behind? He's saying there are different kinds of flesh, which means at the resurrection, we can expect to have a different kind of of flesh, a different kind of physical form. And Paul goes on to continue to say there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. The stars themselves vary in size and color. The stars themselves, they look different. Not every star is the same. There are some stars that are red giants, some stars that are red supergiants, some that are blue dwarfs, some that are red dwarfs, some that are blue supergiants, some that are yellow dwarfs, like our own very sun. They provide differences of size, differences of color, different temperatures, different gravity fields. They're not the same. And so we shouldn't expect everything to be the same when we're resurrected. This is true also of the planets. The planets and the moons are all different. And look at the difference in the solar system. You see small planets like Mercury, and I included Pluto because I'm a millennial and I refuse to buy into the reduction of Pluto as a dwarf planet. It counts. I grew up with it, and nostalgia wins. But Mercury and Pluto are tiny, but Jupiter and Saturn are massive. The Earth is blue and green and brown, and Mars is red. They're different sizes, colors. They have different cores. They look differently. They do different things. Some of them have moons. Some of them have many. Some only have one. Some have none. They're different. And so... We shouldn't expect the same when we're resurrected. When the resurrection comes, we should expect a different kind of glory, just like Jesus had a different glory when he was resurrected. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became life-giving spirit. And so Paul, Paul is pointing out, not only is the resurrection the apex of the gospel message, it is the thing that we need to believe. It is the thing that provides power to the message. And if it's wrong, we lose all the power in our message. But he knows it's true because he saw the resurrected Christ. Not only is it all those things. Not only is it important. Don't be deceived. It's real. But here's the hope. I'll tell you right now, I understand this hope better than I ever have. My wife right now has been going through a horrible struggle. For the last four or five months, she has been having an allergic reaction that there is no answer to yet. I had to leave youth group one night and leave the leaders in charge and take her to the emergency room because she was experiencing anaphylaxis. She couldn't breathe. And she's had hives since that time. And it hasn't changed. And we've tried multiple treatments and we've just got approval for a new one. And I look at her and there's nothing I can do. I can't solve the problem. We don't even know what the source of the problem is. Something is attacking her body. I wish I could help, but I can't. I stand hopeless 
on this side of it, knowing the only thing I can do is pray and hope for wisdom from the doctors to find an answer when they haven't yet. There is a lot of hope in this message. There's a lot of hope in the resurrection that not only does Christ offer us new life here on earth as we finish up this life, not only does he provide us with salvation and access to the Holy Spirit and renew our connection to God the Father, he also promises us a resurrected body and an eternal life with him in the eternal state without the problems of this flesh without having the need to follow after the lusts of the flesh, without being tempted by the sins of this world, and without the kinds of issues that we're dealing with right now. I understand this hope and the passion that Paul has in teaching this to the Corinthian church. It's not the only time that Paul talks about this, that talks about the resurrected body or the hope that is found in Christ. He says the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, on the topic of the bodily resurrection of the church, he tells the church in Thessalonica this. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the great comfort, the change that we are to experience as the church of Jesus Christ. Later on, which we won't get to tonight, but in in the book of 1 Corinthians, he also points out in, in verse 51 that we shall not all sleep, but will all be changed. Meaning that this is connected to the verse in, in, in 1 Thessalonians in that while it is appointed for all men to die at least once, that's a generalization, not a reality to every single man. Because there is a point where Jesus Christ will return for his church. And at that point, those who are alive will be caught up in the air with those who are dead and changed in that moment and given this new body. And that is a great hope. Now he continues to say this. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was on the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as was the man of dust. So also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly man. And this connection, this comparison between Adam and Jesus runs throughout the scripture, and it is so important to understand. See, Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans that if by one man's offense, meaning Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through the one man's righteousness, righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. In Adam, we were given the condemnation. We were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. We lost access to the tree of life, And we were condemned to live with this broken flesh with only hope that redemption would come. Now, Genesis tells us this story. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This seems like a judgment, but it really is a mercy. Adam, in his disobedience, took the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He disobeyed God and he became sinful. And in doing so, 
God's act of mercy was to kick Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden so that they would not have access to the tree of life, so that they did not receive eternal punishment. Because if they ate of the tree of life, they would have been given eternal life, but they would have been given eternal life in their sin. And if they did that, they would have received permanent judgment and separation from God. It is a mercy that he kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. What else did God do in chapter 3? As Adam and Eve were covered themselves up with fig leaves because they recognized they were naked. What does that really mean? They're fully exposed and their shame is exposed. It didn't bother them before because they had nothing to hide. Now they do. They disobeyed God and they want to cover it up. But the fig leaves are not enough. So what does God do? God makes animal skins for Adam and Eve. That means something innocent had to die to cover them up. The gospel is found right there in Genesis 3 to provide redemption for their sin. And redemption is found in the cross of Christ, the innocence of God that was punished for us so that we could receive his grace, just like the animal skins covered the shame of Adam and Eve. The blood of Christ covers our sins so that we can receive eternal life. And at the very end of Scripture, in Revelation 22, it tells us this. It says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Because the resurrected body that we receive, our physical nature is redeemed at the resurrection, which means now we can once again have access to the tree of life because we'll be in a physical state that can contain that without being separated from God because our redemption has been completed. The tree of life completes the story of Scripture. It makes it go full circle. It's what would have happened if Adam chose the tree of life instead of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, obedience instead of disobedience, he would have received the eternal state. Our resurrection allows us to have access once again to the tree of life and eat of it and spend eternity with God. This is the great hope. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. The resurrection of Christ leaves everything hanging in the balance. It is the story that brought one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis, to Jesus. When he was challenged by Tolkien, his friend at Cambridge, to find a way to deny Christianity, you must deny the resurrection and look at the evidence. And the evidence brought C.S. Lewis to Christ And he became one of the greatest theological writers in church history and argued for the existence and the benefit of Christianity to mankind. We've witnessed that in our own time with journalists like Lee Strobel or scientists like Hugh Ross. People who have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the resurrection. What about J. Warner Wallace, the the cold case homicide detective who was once the, the peak at his profession of closing cold cases and homicides through investigation, decided to investigate Christianity and see if he could disprove it as an atheist, and the resurrection led him to Christ. Because as Paul states, not only is it what the gospel leads to, It's incredibly important. Everything hangs on it. It is the hinge of which Christianity hangs. And Paul has evidence for it. And so does history. And it leaves us wondering, what does that mean for us? What it means for us is not just salvation and hope in this life. Not just a change for a better life or to get taken out of bad habits and given a better personal life here or more wealth, or whatever the hope is in this world to make our lives better. 
But it's not just this world. It's not just our attitudes. It's not just our hope that's changed here. It's eternal life in eternity with God, with a new physical form given access again to the tree of life. That all the brokenness of this world, all of the depression of this world, all of the things that make us wish we could exit, all of the anxiety and, and stuff that drags us down, all of the, the stuff we feel ashamed of because we know we're, we're still fallen creatures. Even Paul himself said, why don't I do the things I want to do? And why do I do the things I don't want to do? Because even Paul, the great apostle, struggled with the flesh that he's in and looked forward to the day where he would be freed from that in a new resurrected body. So the resurrection gives us the gospel, it gives us the hope of eternal life, and it provides us with a new physical body that gives us access once again to the tree of life so that we can truly be freed and redeemed, not just spiritually, but physically in the end. And that is a story worth praising God about. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the Apostle Paul and the words you gave him to give to the church. God, I pray that we take it and, and don't walk away from it lightly, but that we understand that this is a message that gives us hope for ourselves and hope for a world that is steeped in darkness. And it is the church's responsibility to be the light as representatives of Christ in this world. And as the world is walking down a dark path, and as the world seems to turn its eyes away from you and accept more culturally dark things, that we can be the light, that we can share the truth and bring people this hope that all the brokenness, brokenness in this world will be redeemed even at the individual physical level. And all it takes is to put our eyes on the cross and to kneel before the Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.